Colleagues, we're moving seamlessly on to the final panel of the day, and in about um, an hour and ten minutes, I'm going to be introducing Wolfgang Novak to close the conference. But before I do that, we have, as I said, a stellar cast of city leaders to bring to you. So I want to invite to come and join me here on the stage Dr. Juan Clos, the former mayor of Barcelona, and of course the executive director for the United Nations Human Settlements Program. Dr. Close, please come and join me. My partner in crime, uh, who's just joined me on the stage, is Andy Altman, uh, uh, and recently chief executive of the London Legacy Development Corporation, former deputy mayor of Philadelphia, and a leader of urban transformations in New York, Washington, D.C., and many other places. I'd like to invite uh, Carl Sederschold, Mayor of Stockholm from 1998 to 2002. Where's Carl? Welcome to Carl. Uh, current Deputy Mayor of London, Isabel Dedring. Isabel, please come and join us. Deputy Mayor of Barcelona, Anthony Vives. And then former Mayor of Washington, D.C., and now CEO and Executive Director of Federal City Council of Washington, Dr. Anthony Williams. Please welcome our city leaders. Well, an awful lot has been said in the last two days about the important leadership implications of the electric city. But we haven't yet had a chance to explore those leadership implications in detail, and we haven't yet had a chance to talk to a group of serving and recent city leaders about that. So, Andy, what do you think are the key issues or questions we should put to this really distinguished panel? <laughs> Well, I think there, uh, there are many, but in the time we have, I think, um, I think one of the key questions that's been very interesting that's come up in the past day, and it came up uh, yesterday and we heard the panel this morning, um, is this, I'd say, sort of tension or uh, discussion between the, uh, on the one hand, what's needed yesterday called the sort of command and control aspects of what's happening in terms of technological change in cities, the systems of cities, the efficiency of cities, the running of cities, the kind of top-down nature of, uh, of, of systemic change with panels such as this morning where we're talking about democratization of technology, how technology can be you know, used to promote uh, more participation and you know, putting technology in the hands of users so they can transform their city, promoting social movements, promoting innovation. And I think it's an interesting, I think, balance and tension between the role of leadership on the one hand and large system change, mm -hmm. uh, and on the other hand, you know, this kind of grassroots movement and enabling movement. And I think we heard a lot about that in the different examples. And I think mayors and leaders of cities uniquely sit at this very critical kind of juncture between, between the two, and in a way at the most sort of you know, local governance um, uh, unit and place really straddle between trying to have, you know, the vision for their city, some of the notion of restoring a sense of, you know, utopia and aspiration that we heard Tony Giddens talking about earlier, with having at the same time the kind of control centers we saw from the Rio examples on the board, how do you actually make your city work efficiently, to, you know, how you also as a city um, enable mm -hmm. uh, you know, democratization of technology, open data, the platforms that will allow innovation that you can't control, which may in fact run very counter to the very agenda you're promoting. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be very interesting in some sense to, you know, to, to have that discussion and to have um, the different leaders here, how they've, how they've dealt with that challenge and how far actually can one take it as a mayor mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, using that platform uh, for, uh, systemic change and long-term change mm -hmm. uh, in your city. Well, that's a wonderful place to start. So the, the system of cities, but the system of the city as well. How can you manage both of these things? Dr. Close, will you begin two or three minutes, your top of mind thoughts, and then we'll invite your colleagues to continue the discussion. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> Well, to, to create this magic moment in a city where, where there's a kind of uh, far-reaching consensus and, and people move more or less in the same direction uh, of improving the convivenciality, uh, it's uh, quite uh, difficult. Uh, it's, it's 
sometimes it has, uh, I think, uh, an irrational component. Uh, because, of course, uh, as it has been said during the conference, the modern society allows all the uh, opinions to be expressed, and you see a lot of voices um, around in the, in the territory. And th then to have uh, mm, uh, the, the lack of finding a common view that allows to generate uh, the, the f strength to move uh, to move uh, ahead, uh, to move forward, it's it's not uh, it's not easy. Uh, we did that in Barcelona for the Olympic Games, uh, uh, for example, because of a crisis. Mm -hmm. you know, we had a huge crisis of huge unemployment, huge uh, deindustrialization, uh, huge uh, inflation. Uh, in, you know, it was uh, the aftermatch of the 73 crisis of, uh, of, uh, of oil, the price of oil, and then our industry, because Barcelona was an industrial city, our industry became obsolete, and then, uh, you know, we, we reached a point where, where we needed to transform the, the, the DNA of the city. No? And uh, of being a dark city, uh, it was called the Manchester of the Mediterranean, sorry for Manchester. Uh, uh, it, 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 you know, uh, and, and, and then uh, now when you see the after, you know, the effects of the change where, where Barcelona is it's clear, it's nice, it's open, it's light. Mm -hmm. you know. But for example, we decided mm, one sector that should be promoted is culture. Mm. Culture because uh, we need more museums, we need an auditorium, we need uh, a, a attractiveness other than industry. Mm. No? Our tourists or our visitors were uh, industrialists in our hotels in the 60s and 70s. And then recently, uh, after the crisis, we invented this kind of tourism of city, no? city tourism which uh, in the 70s and 80s was a kind of uh, novelty. Mm. No? Uh, and and mm, uh, by the way, the touristification of the city has highly been highly criticized mm. in Barcelona. Mm. People is against the, mm, the, the tourists because the tourists are, uh, uh, you know, they do a lot of noise and they, they drink and they do a lot of bad things. But now, with the financial crisis, tourism is the only booming industry in Barcelona. Mm. Mm? Uh, for example, I remember that uh, we had an, a, an, a, a, a fight with the, mm, with the hotel industry in Barcelona. Mm. For the Olympic Games, we talked with the hotel sector, all the big bosses of the hotel sector, and we told them, okay, we want to increase the offer by 300%. We, we, we are going to multiply the bed, uh, uh, hotel bed capacity of Barcelona, 300 per, per three. And they said, no way, that's going to be a fight. Mm. And in fact, it was a fight. Mm. We, uh, we just invited the international chains to come to Barcelona to invest. But when we invite, uh, invited the international chains to invest in Barcelona, they were uh, frightened by the locals and they didn't came, just they didn't came. They were, af you know, afraid of investing in Barcelona. Hilton, uh, Sheraton, all these people, they, finally we need to took a very strong decision. For the Olympic Games, we did something what is very, if you think about it, it's very strong. We took five uh, uh, pieces of land which were public land, and we catalog these five pieces of land, hotel service uh, sector, uh, and of course that, that was for a socialist government at the moment, it was quite, uh, but in order to break the monopoly of the offer, we needed to do something like that. Yeah. Mm? And uh, you know, then, but why all that was possible? Because the general consensus coming out of the crisis was there. Then never lose the opportunity of a good crisis. <laughs>
Thank you very much very indeed. True. It sounds like you, you've said something very important about motivational mechanisms and devices, a crisis in Olympic Games. But you've also said something about the necessity of conflict yeah. to change. It's very important to have that. Um, Andy, I think if you agree, we should hear from Dr. Williams, and yes. then I'm going to ask you for a comment. Mm -hmm. Washington, D.C., when you took it over, Dr. Williams, was a place that was perceived to be having a certain kind of crisis. What do you think the city leadership implications are of the new electric city that we're talking about today? Well, first of all, thank you for promoting me to a uh, doctor. I'm really not a doctor, but I'm happy to have received the uh, appellation. Well, it's that medicine you gave me earlier. Okay, good. <laughs> you, know. <laughs> you know, Washington, D.C., uh, I think of uh, you know, Washington, D.C. as a planned city, as uh, Andy always said. Uh, a pl it didn't exist uh, before 200 years ago. So to compare uh, Washington, D.C. with a city like London or an ancient city, you know, it, we're just a baby city, a, a still evolving experiment. But I think of uh, Washington, D.C., and I think of, uh, you know, I came in here on the plane, it was an unusually clear day, s at least for me it was unusual, and most of the times I've arrived in London, it was always you know, cloudy. So it was a crystal clear day, and you know, come in over the Irish Sea through Liverpool and Birmingham, and then got sweeping right turn to head down the river, and you could see all the commercial and political and entertainment monuments all beautifully lit. And it reminds me why uh, people come to cities. They come to cities for a vision, uh, for a better life for their families. And when you're in political power, that's really your fundamental responsibility. And the way I always analogize it is you're building a bridge. In Washington, D.C., building this bridge was very, very difficult because nothing worked. So what's the first thing you do when you build a bridge? You have to build a solid foundation, a solid foundation of settled expectations for investment, for people leading their lives, for public safety, for public services. How about answering the phones? All those basic things have to be in place. That's your foundation. And then once you have built that foundation, once you have with your constituency that faith and that trust, then you can actually start building the bridge. But you, can't, you can only build a bridge so far. If you, don't if, you don't if you don't create a span that's large enough, what's the point? If you create it too far, and there are many examples of this in politics, a bridge will collapse. So you have to lead your public only so far. And what I found myself doing over eight years was having this conversation, building this bridge. 70% of the time I'm building foundation, keeping people satisfied, building that trust, and then 30% of the time building that span. For me, a big part of building this span and pulling people was to say, we're going to make a major initiative in the city, the Anacosta River. And the reason why I knew the Anacosta River initiative was successful was when I started, People were saying, what the hell is the Anacostia River? What is he talking about? And by the time I ended, and no one ever says how great a job you've done when you're mayor, your mayor, he only know you're successful when they criticize you in your terms. Mm -hmm. So by the time I left office, they were saying, well, the mayor hasn't achieved enough in the vitally important Anacostia River <laughs> initiative. He hasn't done this. He hasn't done that. That's when you know you're successful because you've successfully built this bridge. Andy, you were there? Yes. <laughs> Well, you know, one question I, I would ask um, is, you know, I it's interesting because of the Barcelona, and we'll hear more about Barcelona, but the thing that always strikes you amazing about Barcelona, which um, Mayor Williams, when you're in Washington, learned a lot from, which was the sort of the big moves about the city. And there's a lot of discussion today about the big vision for the city, the big interventions. I remember the, the word from Barcelona was always, you know, use a project to motivate change, very much about project-driven kind of um, um, planning, if you will, and urban transformation. I'm struck by that with the balance of how far does one go with the kind of the, the, the sort of the big visions, the master plans, ideas, and what we're hearing a lot about, and I think in the discussion today, is this very different balancing of the thousands and thousands of ideas and how much we actually empower through technology that's allowing more and more people to engage in the dialogue about their cities, ideas about their cities, and how to bring those forward and balance those with the big vision, this sort of the top-down, bottom-up tension, and how, one, how far one is willing to go between that line between where leadership is and how much one is led by those ideas. Because as, as uh, I think Dan you know, pointed out in the last presentation, sometimes you may have a lot of different ideas coming forward, but they may actually not represent actually democratic input. It may be technology is being manipulated in a certain way. 
So how's that balancing act between that Barcelona and Washington, both have had big visions, and that kind of balance of how far one goes and how you facilitate the thousands and thousands of ideas that come from what technology can enable in terms of democratic action? I just open it up. Have a short, yeah, no. short well, uh, this, is a, this is a problem for the leadership. When, when you are there in front, uh, there's one day that you need to take the decision. And in that day, you are very alone. <laughs> eh, because a lot of people give ideas, opinions, etc. Um, you know, that's very, that's for cheap, very cheap. But there's one day that you need to say, okay, I'm going to do that. And it, it's going to have this color. And it's going to have this size and this impact. Uh, and and then that is a, a, differ, a very difficult moment. There's plenty of occasions where that is not done. When this, this final responsibility of saying, okay, let's do it and that way, this is a very tough question. Uh, you know, it's quite often uh, uneasy to criticize the politicians. I think that even the way that now the idiom that we are using about politics is very, uh, you know, the politicians are those kind of uh, stupid people that are <laughs> there in front. Uh, you know, d d d what are we doing that? I think that this is, this is very poor, uh, you know, thinking. Eh? We cannot blame the politicians, uh, you know, if you want to just present yourself and take you the decision. You know, it's, it's, uh, y um, I, I would uh, say, and I'm sure that the, the mayor uh, will share that, that at the w there's one moment that you feel very alone. And it's when you need to risk even your political career and decide wha what should be done. But you, you need to trespass this frontier. It's like the, the book of, of, uh, of, the joint, uh, of Conrad, eh? uh, transpassing the, the shadow, I think is the name of the book. Eh? Uh, you need to, we need one day you need to say, okay, we are going to do so. So this really brings us back to Anthony Giddens' point about risk mm. and also your point about conflict. I just want to see if Anthony Williams wants to comment further and then you're going to come in, please. I think you should, you can't be risk averse and be a leader. You have to be able to have the negotiation with your publics. If you, tr if you see public services martyrdom and you're basically there to dictate and people either believe in the truth or not, like they're going to church or something, then you're going to fail. And if you just uh, simply, if you simply function, uh, you see public services being the maitre d' and taking dinner orders, you may not nominally fail, but substantively you failed. You've got to have that balance of risk reward, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and I think knowing that balance and having the right kind of cadence, I think is important. In other words, if you're looking for a safe haven and calm waters and you shouldn't be a leader, <laughs> you're going to be in the heavy weather and you've got to be able to kind of ride that out and deal with it, you know. I think that it was Henry Ford who said, if I was just listening to my clients, I will just invent a faster oh. horse. Oh. Yes. <laughs> you know? Mm, there's a moment that you need to... Yeah. Yeah. You don't but need a faster horse. No. Now, Carl Schellefeld, you were mayor of Stockholm during the period that Stockholm became a kind of iconic first mover city in many of the things we now call the smart city movement. So what kind of leadership did that electric city require? Well, I think I, I am a, a sucker for history, so I always start with the historical perspective because I think that's extremely important if you are to understand what's going on now. Mm. And actually, Stockholm had a bit of a luck because we were organizing the UN uh, Environmental Conference, the first UN Environmental Conference in 1972 in Stockholm. Mm. Well, that was a conference, fine. But what happened was that media were full of environment for months. Mm. And I think this created the basis among the Stockholmers. It made them aware of that there is something uh, called environment and there are obviously problems with the environment. And how does it look here at home? Uh, well, the water is not that good. Uh, the air is uh, not that good. Mm. So there was a feeling very quickly that uh, something had to be done. 
And in Sweden, we have a saying that uh, when you're facing a problem, we have a saying that said, start digging where you stand. <laughs> and that's what Stockholm did. It started digging where it stood, uh, taking, uh, investing in sewage, water sewage treatment, uh, investing in uh, district heating. Mm. And then we went on to this Hammarbyssörd Sjöstad, which has become sort of inter international example of everything. Mm. And I think one, today, the most in interesting thing about Hammarbyssörstad is two things. Uh, there was no contention, although it's a rather radical project, between the citizens and the politicians who wanted to do this. Mm. People were sort of saying, oh, this is a sensible idea, this old dilapidated part of the harbour should, should come to good use, and although they, they impose strict uh, measures and rules regarding uh, energy and uh, waste recycling and things like that, well, it's good for the environment, so, uh, uh, and investing a lot of taxpayers' money, mm. and still the majority of the citizens said that, well, fine, mm. it's sensible. Uh, and I think there is another thing, that we have been able for a long time to create a working majority, regardless of whether we have had a center-right or a center-left uh, coalition running the city, mm. uh, that this should be done. And so you have this long-term vision uh, and also the security for the politicians that they know as, as far as they're uh, handling these matters, it will not affect uh, whether they are re-elected or not. They may be thrown out for other reasons, but not for that reason. Mm. So, uh, and that is, I think, is absolutely basic, and many people have said that already, that you have to have a lot, the, the leadership has to have a long-term vision, as Juan Cruz said, be ready to make decisions at a certain point, whether you have all the information or not. Mm. Uh, and I think we've uh, managed to, a good to, to some extent to do that. And, and so it's a process mm. that has gone on for a long time. And I think this is also, just to finish now, this is also one of the reasons, and I must say personally, I was a bit surprised that the Stockholmers, in connection with the general elections in 2006, voted in favor of congestion charges, mm. which of course made it much more easy to uh, implement the system afterwards. Mm. Uh, and, but there is also one other point in that which is important, and that is that in the suburbs of the municipalities around, they were not very happy mm. about the vote in Stockholm. So what the new government did was that uh, the new centre-right government did that was it decided, yes, we have had a referendum, there will be congestion charges in line with the trial period we've had, and the net income of that system would go to uh, improvement of the road infrastructure in the Stockholm region. Mm. And after that, total silence, no opposition. <laughs> Very good politics by the sound of it, Andy. And um, what you've said, Carl, I think very importantly is creating this space mm -hmm. in which you can both build a consensus and politicians can act long term mm -hmm. is this kind of critical catalyst. If you can do that, you can take decisions that might otherwise see you drummed out of office in another city. Later on, I think we want to come back to you to the question which will be relevant for Washington and for Barcelona as well, as to whether there are adv advantages or disadvantages in being one of the first movers. If you like, Stockholm was in a sense one of the first smart cities. Has it proved to be good to be a first mover or have you had some costs and consequences with that? But Andy, if you agree, we've got two serving deputy mayors here who've been listening to the wise who are now out of office but two people who are actively running their cities, Anthony Vives in Barcelona, Isabel Dedring in London. What's your view of the challenge for leading the electric city, given the vantage point of 2012 and everything you've both got to do in the next period of time? I was, I was just gonna come back to, um, I mean, your question earlier, Andy, about the, um, you know, the sort of technology component. Oh, the shuttle's there, that's all right, sorry. Thank you. Um, I mean, some of these things are sort of hard to comment on because they're very live in London at the moment. But um, uh, what we're seeing certainly on a number of fronts, um, air quality is one area I'm involved in, also step-free accessibility and the links to the Paralympics and cycling and the road networks. 
where increasingly we're seeing the agenda not just influence but actually shape from below, so on Twitter, uh, through blogs, et cetera. And the risk, I think, for very large institutions is that suddenly from having to sort of manage, say, 80 institutionalized stakeholders, they suddenly are trying to use that approach to manage 8 million people who have got an opinion or, say, 2 million people who are digitally aware and having an opinion digitally. Um, and, you know, the institution has a kind of nervous breakdown and needs to check itself into a clinic because it can't handle that kind of Twitter activity and the way that debate is taking place in the way that you would traditionally manage, you know, I use that slightly derogatory term to manage stakeholders in the way that we've traditionally done. So um, the institution, certainly that w where we are, you know, th it's changing probably a bit slowly, but you can see the institution trying to respond to that dynamic of um, how do we engage with people and at the mo Initially, I think the reaction is one of, you know, terror and, you know, sort of the walls all going up because we don't really know how to engage. Um, but on some of these subjects now, what's happening is that, you know, you actually meet the people who are blogging or who are on Twitter actively and you draw them in and help them, bring them in to help you solve the problems that you've got. And in fact, ideally, as you say, with a crisis, you know, you can, in a way, your enemies can be your best friends because they're turning up the heat on something that you want to do anyway. That is a good thing. Um, so in ideally, whilst initially I think it's seen, some of the digital change was seen as an even bigger threat in terms of trying to manage so many voices, ultimately uh, it can be a much more effective way to get change and generate that point of temperature where everybody says, you know, we really need to do something because instead of having three voices saying it, say three institutionalized lobby groups, you suddenly get, you know, 3,000 people saying it. If we can get into that place, but we're not there at the moment yet. But, you know, that's where I think the trend is going. The risk for big institutions, I think, is that they're just not, um, you know, they're not designed to think in those kinds of terms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every incentive is to kind of, you know, put up the walls and, you know, well, you need to deal with us through our stakeholder management process and our correspondence system, mm -hmm. uh, which obviously isn't going to be the way uh, that's going to work in dealing with some of these issues. So you've got a, di a digitized citizenry, but you don't really have a digitized city government. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, ultimately, uh, rather, I think there's probably going to be some process where initially it's seen as a major threat. Then it's kind of, oh, we're sort of getting ourselves digitized. You know, my Chancellor for London recently launched a Facebook page, which just felt so tragic <laughs> to me. Cause it was like, you know, let's not look at how many people like and don't like that. Um, uh, and then, but then ultimately, could you move to a position where it's actually a benefit? You know, that's where we need to get to, but you feel it's going to take at least a few years to get into that kind of a position. Great. Thank you. Tony. <laughs> uh, I might be a bit disruptive, uh, but... Um, that's I've not unusual. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've uh, been listening to uh, most of the people talking here, of course, here in the table, but before, and I've l heard a lot about uh, management, mm. but I haven't heard almost anything about politics. Mm -hmm. um, and I am a politician. Uh, I'm, I'm very bad as a technician. I'm a horrible manager. I'm a lousy uh, internet user, uh, but I have a couple of ideas. Mm. And um, I love to see more people talking about politics in here. Mm. Um, ideology, vision, this is what people pay us for. Mm. And most of the time we are trying to talk about things that are some other guy comfort zone. Uh, and because we listen to them, we finish talking about the issues they are interested in rather than the issues we should be talking about. Mm. And I want to talk about things that interest me. Um, I think that uh, we have to face it. We are living uh, uh, the end of a uh, capitalistic cycle uh, in our, s our capitalist society is reaching the uh, last phase of, uh, of uh, I'm sorry for my English, uh, we are in a mature phase of the capitalistic cycle. And uh, we have to understand that this is happening now here here in London, in Barcelona, in Cape Town, uh, everywhere. And if we don't face that, mm. this, um, this uh, 
system based on, um, how to say, uh, freedom, liberty, democracy, representative or participative, I don't care, is gonna fail because there there's gonna be someone out there saying, hey, this is the path, follow me, and anyone will know uh, where the guy is taking all of us, and we have to face that. And my feeling is that if we don't go back to basics, which means in terms of my responsibility, at least in Barcelona, if we don't go back to the police, mm -hmm. understanding that the citizen, the new citizen that we have is a full person with a l very strong capacity to decide by himself or herself, we are lost. I mean, what we've seen these last hours is that we have very capable uh, uh, citizens, uh, very capable society, and the only answer that we have for that is what I call this uh, uh, post-Sartrean, uh, existentialist, post-Freudian uh, attitude towards the current situation in which we ask people to go out and find some other, because I don't feel right, and, and people want to go out to the street, and we think about Facebook. What the hell, this is bullshit. Uh, I mean, uh, this is very typical of a tired society with no vision at all. Let's talk about ourselves. How do you call this thing that we have in here? Yeah. Uh, no, the gut. No, the, this hole that we have. Uh, yeah, yeah. We talk about your belly. Navel thing. The navel thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, I mean, uh, we uh, we need a doctor. Yeah. Uh, Dr. And, uh, Williams. Yeah. And the other and the other reaction. <laughs> this is the first reaction. Can help you. And the other reaction is, uh, let's become smart. And everybody's happy then. We are all very smart. And, uh, and you have those companies selling uh, us uh, bracelets and uh, mirrors, mm -hmm. like Conquistadores uh, reaching uh, Moctezuma. And uh, yes, they can make us f uh, fail, eh? because uh, uh, Hernan Cortez did it with 500 men and some horses. Yeah. Uh, I have enough of that, mm. enough. And I think that, um, we have to admit, uh, uh, of course I don't agree with the guys that says that said that the history is over, neither the guy that's saying that we're living the end times, uh, like uh, this uh, CZ, CZ uh, philosopher. I think that there's a new future here with us. We have to generate a new vision based on what? On progressiveness, social cohesion, and industry. And it's, it's going to have a new face Industry doesn't need chimneys going uh, back to the center of the town, but we need industry right in the middle of the town. We need distributed in industries. We need uh, what we call uh, uh, fabrication at an elms. We need a new civic implication. We need a new democracy for sure, but we also need the participative, participative democracy. We need all that now. Otherwise, we will have to close it. Mm -hmm. That's my thing. Well, let's <laughs> there's a lot there. Let's pick up on a couple things since we've gone around once. Um, so it's interesting because you raised this idea. So there's this idea about you know vision and leadership and politics, um, and not just this being about you know sort of management per se. Um, and and uh, we've heard a lot about you know the different ideas that are that are um, proliferating about the city and how to manage that tension. Um, so it, it really raises a very interesting question. I mean, you know, Tony Giddens talked about this sort of bringing back a kind of, you know, utopian aspiration and a kind of utopian realism. And, and of course, the role of mayors, you know, as being in a way the chief planners, the chief architects of the city, a visionary for the city, you have that opportunity. Um, at the same time, the tension of, you know, you're elected for how long? It could be four year term and changes to the city are the long systemic changes are long term. So for me, I guess a question I'm very intrigued by if this raises is, you know, do cities, do you as having the positions you've been in or are in, how does a city understand, does it, do, do we understand what it means to be the electric city, to be the green city, how the city of the future? Where does one get those ideas from for your vision, for your leadership that allows you to, you know, take forward what could be very large change? Do we even understand the infrastructure of the 21st century, right? That it is not just, I mean, what does that mean? We had an interesting even little debate this morning about the announcement yesterday. Well, if you had 50 million pounds, you know, you could put it in 
you know, what was announced here, or people talked about, well, I would do Wi-Fi, or there were 30, you know, hundreds of ideas, right? All those kinds of debates. When you're the mayor of a city, you have to make a decision. You have to understand your city. You have to decide a vision that you want to put forward if you want to be a visionary leader. Do we understand the 21st century city? Do we understand what the green city is? Or do we get caught, which can happen in one fad or being sold one particular product? We heard of lots of different products over the last couple of days, people who would be coming into your door to sell you different products, many of which could be good and helpful. How does one sift through this in an information age, the massive amount of ideas that are out there to go forward and understand what it is for the city that's going to lay that foundation? No, the, the answer is no. The answer is no. Uh, uh, and the problem that we have is that we are not, we are not real clients. We are caught uh, by uh, uh, the industry because the industry is interested in selling what they already have, more horses, uh, faster horses, while we haven't generated, uh, regenerated ourselves as a, a real clients. That is why, um, and we are taught by two paradigms, uh, the pilot programs. Mm -hmm. I, we have Barcelona full of pilot programs. I can, I have some of them here. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and the other paradigm is best practices. Everybody has best practices. And we have, we see the, I am fed up with the real best practice, by the way, because everybody is talking about that. Uh, uh, the, the, the problem that we have is that we have to become client. And I want to go back again, uh, to the vision thing. We have to know what we have to ask for. And uh, Greg knows it very well. That's why we are developing what w a, 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 a world movement that we call the city protocol in which cities by themselves have to decide what a good city is. And a good city is not the addition of the best uh, Juan and the best uh, Anthony and the best Andy, because when you have the best of each of us, what you get is a Frankenstein, as I always tell you. <laughs> uh, uh, what we have to have is the best Juan by himself and the best Anthony by himself, which means the best Washington and the best Barcelona and the best London by themselves. Provided that we understand that our, our metabolism mm. is the same. Mm. So the basic metabolism of a city stands the same for Tombuctu and Barcelona. If we don't understand that, this is ideological, huh? which means that the south and the north go together by the hand, mm. and then we are going to be able to ask for what we really want, not more mirrors, neither bracelets. Thank you. So one way to summarize it, you've really said it, is that cities all have the same metabolism, even if they have different DNA. Yes. And that creates the opportunity both for exchange and for differentiation. Yes. Anthony Williams. Uh, my, you know, I have a big shtick that cities only share a fraction of the information that non-governmental and private sector organizations share. I work for a company that is a $600 million company. We're basically the leading companies in the world, shared information. Now, even though private sector's got an existential threat and my business can go out of business, I still share information with other businesses because the notion is we might as well compete at a high rather than a dumb level. And I think cities, notwithstanding this plethora of best practices, can do a much better job of sharing basic information. So I work with the governor of Detroit about, a governor of Michigan about the collapse of Detroit. They're doing the same things we did in Washington. We're doing the same things New York did. We're all paying top dollar to basically do the same things rather than sharing mm. basic bottom line information. Mm. The other thing is transparency. People think of transparency as got you. I got, the, I, got, I got some information about something a politician did that's stupid because they were given a $30 meal as opposed to the limit for a $20 meal, and wow, geez, you know, I got this information, and that's transparency. No, to me, transparency is everything ought to be out in the open. You know, if you're the political leader, everything ought to be out in the open. And then the last point I would make is I don't think there's a dichotomy between running your city well and being a politician. This conversation I'm talking mm. about is a political conversation. You know, I inherited a city that was a wreck because there were plenty of people who gave great speeches, they had a great vision, and there was no connection whatsoever between a vision and execution and a reality. And part of leading a city is, yes, dealing with the politics, but connecting it to real people and real lives and mm. real outcomes. So the, the point you're making is, is about how cities learn to combine vision with execution, mm -hmm. but you're making a broader point about how city leaders learn anyway, and whether any kinds of exchange are valid. Carl wants to come in, so does Joanne, so, and then Isabel. 
Well, I agree uh, with Tony as far as addition is uh, a basis for, because you have to sort of orient, orient yourself in, in, in reality and, and decide for yourself where do you want to go. Mm. But then this vision has to be, uh, to be as Anthony was talking about, it, you can't just talk. You have to, to establish real goals define real goals. We're going to do this, we're going to do this, and, that, and we're, we're going to do this, and we're going to do it because of. So, uh, <coughs> and this means that there has to be a sort of, when it functions well, it has to be a sort of continuous process of exchanging of information between the stakeholders, uh, business, uh, universities, academia, citizens, and the political leadership in the city hall. And my experience from 23 years as a full-time politician in the City Hall of Stockholm was that you do as best you can. And you try to get as much information as you can, best, uh, that you can. Uh, you hopefully employ intelligent people in your staffs that can analyze trends and information and from what you have and where you stand, you make decisions. And that's the only way to do it. And sometimes you succeed, and sometimes you're lucky, and you obviously got hold of the right information at the right time, and you made the right decision, and things start to move. Uh, that's the, the, the only way. One, I, one of my sort of, uh, which I alwa always stressed and uh, nagged about in, in the debates we had in the City Council of Stockholm on energy policy, should you have congestion charges or not, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that I was always opposing those people who said that there is one solution, big A, to the problem. I said, if we go for one solution, big A, whether it's waste management or traffic control, uh, we're really in the shit. So what we had to do and what you have to do is pluralism. And of course, it's uh, obviously sensible to use combined methods in whatever you do. But there is another factor in, in it and inherent in, in Andy's question and that with the information flow you have today, <laughs> you don't have all information at any time. If you're not being pluralistic, uh, you are heading straight down into the ditch. Thank you. Do you want to close? Yeah, I if, if I can give some I new inputs in relation to my position now in UN Habitat. Uh, we, we are supposed to be the, the global, the planetary observatory of urbanization. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, because if we come out of the Electric City Conference with this kind of optimism, uh, a little bit irrational optimism that everything is... Uh, it's do is going well. Uh, I think I I we are wrong, mm. or you are wrong, yeah. because I, I I can tell you from my observatory that wha what we are seeing is that urbanization in the world is not going well. Mm. Mm. That the prevailing urbanization model that it's been done in the emerging cities, the ones that are growing, mm. it's substantively wrong. Uh, because it's not sustainable, it's not um, uh, equitable. Mm. In fact, we have the worst symptoms of urbanization prevailing everywhere. You know, I, uh, the huge success, commercial success of the gated community. You know, if you want to sell a piece of land in an uh, African city, you sell a gated community and you will make a lot of money. And this is the end of the city. Eh? This is the end of, s of the street life, the, the factory of conviviality. This is the end of, you know, of, of this paradigm that we are selling uh, here, that with tech, uh, we are going to connect everybody and we are going to, to be very happy. Eh? No, no. The, the, the cities that we are building now, the cities that the industry of building cities is are building, it's a wrong model. Yeah. Another, sorry, no, finally, no. just the price of, rea of, of uh, residential units in the developing world, it's unsustainable. Mm. There's a crisis. You know, nobody in Nairobi can um, buy with the, their own legal money uh, 
an apartment. It's too expensive. Mm. In a poor country, mm. then careful, eh? mm. there are things that they are not going in the uh, good direction. Uh, Andy's going to come in, then Isabel, then Tony. Then I'm going to ask everyone in the room if they want to make some points. So if you could have the microphones ready, that would be good. So, well, I, it's exactly the question I was the next thing I wanted to ask you because you know, not in, 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 um, in the current role you have, where you see so many cities around the world, and put aside your mayor of Bar former mayor of Barcelona role, which is you know, it's one thing for us to talk about Washington and Barcelona and London and Stockholm and you know, places that you know have you know, sort of global cities and, you know, sophisticated governments and the expertise that Philip showed on the board of urban planning expertise to deal with these issues. But the hundreds of cities, right, where millions and millions of people are coming to every day churning where that expertise may not exist, where they're growing at a rapid, rapid speed, um, where, you know, the, the rate of urbanization is just, you know, um, kind of unfathomable. How do, you, how do the cities that you see out there that are growing so quickly how do you affect that change? How does this kind of conversation that we're having today, how do you see, how do you see this translating there on the ground in terms of what ultimately will determine from a kind of larger global perspective, sustainability, green cities? These are the cities that are gonna have massive influence on the direction that we're going globally. And from the, your vantage point, the United Nations, how do you see the role of what's of that knowledge transfer, what's happening at the grassroots and what's happening with these major intermediaries, the World Bank, the UN, all the others who are out there. What's happening there in terms of that connection yes. and we that influence? Mm, uh, just very, very short. Yeah. We are not well, well equipped to help them now because we come with ideas of the developed city and we come from the modernism, uh, urbanism of Le Courbosier and poor nightmare that uh, who died yesterday. And, and this is what they, they don't need the tower in the garden, they don't, don't need the super block, they don't need this kind of things that we are building very well uh, uh, and mm, that they're a very good business, mm. real estate business. The, the, this is not, not what they need. They need some political help in order to learn to create city institutions. You know, we are trying to convince them to create nation institutions, but if they don't know even before to create city institutions, because there's no city institutions, mm. you know, they fight for the land as much. Mm. For land, they can even kill each other, mm. you know? And, and, and this is the real problem, that the social conflict, it's, it's uh, you know, they are, the GDP per capita, it's $1,000 there. And here we are $35,000, $40,000 per capita. Mm. Then, you know, we should be thinking in our thi uh, cities when we were $1,000 per capita. And this is the 17th century, mm. okay? Then uh, uh, it's, it's a kind of a problem in translation. Eh? The tr we are lost in translation, that's true. Thank you. Let's have a comment, please, from Isabel Dedring and Tony Vives, and then from our delegates. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think I was going to sort of probably disagree with the point that, you know, the metabolism of cities being common. I mean, maybe I'm misunderstanding the point, but I feel we spend a lot of time fending off either, you know, people selling us stuff or people saying, here's some best practice that just isn't appropriate in our governance structure. You know, yes, New York and London look very similar, but the powers that we have versus the powers they have and the way the whole city works and the political dynamic within the city is completely different. So there's a, I think that's the north-south issue as well, but there's also even between any individual, two individual cities, you have that problem too. Um, you know, so, so in certain developing settings, you know, sort of I've always been an advocate of enlightened despotism and, you know, you might want more dictatorship <laughs> in certain scenarios because it's going to be more effective in achieving change and the governance structures are far more significant than the policies themselves. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure you can say that there's this dichotomy between vision and management because if management is a tool for either delivering a better vision, which is what you were saying, um, or also kind of hoovering up vision from below and then kind of, you know, executing it, uh, then I'm not sure those two need to be mutually exclusive. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. I, I didn't say they were exclusive at all. I say that when you only got management, uh, you have the, what we call in Catalan, the blind cow. Uh, the cow is uh, eating uh, grass until it ends, but uh, she never knows why it ends. Eh? 
Um, as long as she's having a good time. Yeah, well, it's not a matter of having a good time. It's <laughs> a matter of having a good color, having progress, uh, going back to, to the city. Uh, I want to go back to what uh, Mr. Flo said before. Of course, when you talk about uh, African uh, society and in, the, in, in the very extreme, he's absolutely uh, right. Uh, uh, the, the, the right to the city perhaps should be the first right of uh, some of this uh, uh, society. But going to more stable uh, societies such as the affluent countries, uh, you know, in Barcelona we get uh, an average of uh, one official visit per day, mm. and they come to us to learn, theoretically, how a good city is built. And uh, I haven't made the real test uh, or the, the real research on that, but I am sure that almost 98% of the guys that come to Barcelona, they take back to their cities uh, two liters of beer, perhaps a love affair, but uh, no model at all. Because when you go to their cities, you discover that you always get Los Angeles in a way or another being built there. So uh, the problem is why? this, what Mr. Klaus said, why the current city production model, uh, though being wrong, is prevailing? Mm. That's the real question that we have to put. And the question is again related to the alternative, because we haven't been able to build a sound alternative. Mm. And in order to be sound, we live in a world made of capital, we have to build a real new business model and demonstrate. The Archangel touched it uh, very well. It, uh, I think he was very good when he said that uh, we have to build uh, alternatives not based on the hammer on your head, yeah. uh, but based on an alternative that has to be viable, that has to be business uh, oriented, and that has to be, of course, embedded into it, socially oriented. I think that's the real, the real quest that we have. Thank you very much. So people may dream of Barcelona, but they end up building Los Angeles. <laughs> and something to do with the absence of the toolbox and their understanding of how to use it. I want to come now to our delegates. We've, we've heard about stabilizing the city and open leadership and management. We've heard about the DNA metabolism nexus. We've heard about the challenge to translate vision to real execution and implementation. We've heard that most of the urbanization that's happening in the world is wrong. Yes. Wrong. Yes, yes. We're going yes. the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We're going the wrong way. No bovine metaphor seemed to solve the problem, as far as I could tell, um, around the table. <laughs> and so th there's an awful lot here to be discussed. And what I'm going to ask our city leaders to do is listen carefully to the remarks from the room and then pick up on a couple of remarks that you really want to follow up on. What I'm going to ask our delegates to do is do not give us your life story. <laughs> do not make a speech. One remark, please. And I'm going to look at people who weren't looked at earlier. So anyone down this side of the room? Uh, Dan, you've had a speech, so you're not going to go first. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, you're first. You're second. Oh, did he? Okay, someone who hasn't spoken already. So when well, Nikki Gavron has spoken already, you haven't spoken already. You're first, sir. And then you're second, sir, with the board. If you've spoken already, keep your hand down. We'll come to you later. Right. Keep your hand up and the microphone gets there a little bit quicker. <laughs> and if we can have two microphones working, that will be even faster. Um, my name is Ben Allen. I'm an architect. Um, I was just uh, thinking about to talk about uh, political vision and um, also yesterday, the last few days, talking about technological vision. And um, one of the things as an architect, I sort of miss is talking about design vision. And um, I think that, um, of course, as an architect, I think that we kind of potentially hold the, the, the key to bringing these two things together. And as a kind of European, of course, I like my cities like most North Americans being uh, kind of 19th century cities. But I think the kind of vision of the future city is something which has been uh, sort of very exciting to the more visionary ideas of the Asian city and the sort of South American cities. And in a way to bring, to provide solutions between these two sides of political vision and technological vision, it turns out it's been that somehow the kind of missing ingredient is the design solution. Thank you very much. Design Solutions, you're next, sir. If you, that microphone could go over here to Christian Lefebvre, that would be good, yes? Yeah, uh, Mark Swilling from South Africa. I just want to um, engage 
in this discussion from the point of view of cities in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, where the majority of residential develop uh, dwellings and structures are built by people themselves, not by states, not by companies. And this gives rise to a particular form of urbanism, which is predicated on the assumption that the most valuable capability is flexibility. So th that's really about learning and unlearning in a blink of an eye as contexts shift. And this creates very vibrant societies and a set of capabilities for adaptation, evolution, and, and structuring complex environments, which is very similar to the kinds of values that Dr. Sennett was t talking about this morning, which is necessary. And it's completely different to the sanitized, well-planned images of the city that come that that has pervaded quite a lot of the discussions in the, la in, in the last two days. And this is quite a contrast. Uh, and, I, and I really think we need to rather value what's emerging in these cities and work with these trajectories because it's exciting uh, and may well produce the kind of urban cultures that we need for the kind of world that we're heading into rather than the very structured, inflexible environments that are set in, in many uh, northern cities. Wonderful. Now, I'm sure Joanne Close will respond to that. Colleagues, it's not compulsory to be male to ask a question or make a point. This gentleman's next, but uh, uh, you will go next, sir. But then after that, I'm going to issue a, a gender bar, okay? So, uh, Pierre Lacombe, University of Louvain, and uh, Foundation for the Urban Environment Project. So my question is, uh, there is a, 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 a uniform kind of push to coastal areas. All the cities around the table are examples of this. All are threatened by what Professor Gibbons has said at the previous session. That means uh, uh, insurmountable uh, increase of uh, natural capacity. Mm -hmm. So my question is, in, for in, in face of that threat, is there not something that can unite uh, the opposition of cities and the majority of cities to get a kind of common master plan for the most important and urgent investments that have to be done in the cities all over the world, particularly in the hot zones, uh, as they are called, uh, in order to protect themselves against uh, and get the resilience needed to uh, resist to the coming threats of uh, the New York type of typhoon. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So that for that microphone, there's a, a woman over there who's got her hand up. That could go to her. This microphone to this gentleman, and then it's going to Pam Alexander. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alex Feldman from U3 Ventures in Philadelphia. My question is, we've heard uh, at this conference that cities are taking the lead in and, and, and sort of leading their own destiny, more so than national governments having a policy that sort of is in favor of cities. Can, can cities do this on their own, or is there a need for a strong national urban policy that really drives city development? Yeah, or at least uh, a national policy that's not anti-city, perhaps. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Paula Hurst, I work for a firm called Mazar. We advise on um, business models for cities and um, financing of new development infrastructure. Um, and my question really relates in in this current time where we're in the financial crisis, you alluded to the opportunity for disruptive innovation. Um, an executive mayor of Barcelona talked about how we need different models and we need to think about doing things differently. That's never clearer than in the financial industry at the moment. And the question really I have is if now's the time, uh, what do we need to do to get there, to do things differently, and uh, how can we just make it happen? Okay, thank you very much. That microphone needs to come over to this side of the room. Pam, you're next. Uh, Pam Alexander, PhD Academy of Urbanism, also on the board of Smith Nicholson and the Design Council. Um, and I think, like all good conferences, this one's about to leave us with all the questions that we want to answer tomorrow and we're all going away. For me, um, one of the most exciting things that I've heard is about the possibility for thinking globally and producing locally because of what digital fabrication could do. And I think We've talked about the three, two of the three legs of the stool. We've talked about the social city. We've talked about the environmental city. We really haven't talked about the economic city. We've well, talked about well, the economic. economic city. We've even talked about the fourth dimension. We've talked a lot about what technology might want to do for a city, but we actually haven't talked about what a city might want 
technology to do sorts of economy and what that d DNA is and what that fabric that we might all learn from is and what the DNA of individual cities can tell us. And I'd, I'd love to take that one forward. Wonderful. Sir, you're next. <coughs> I'm Rajesh Mishra from India. Located in a city of developing society, I, f I fully agree with, with the point that urbanization is going the wrong way. But uh, what I feel that it's not a problem of, uh, uh, of the tension between execution and uh, vision, but also there is sometimes contaminated, contaminated visions. Visions biased or loaded. Sometimes national visions locally biased. So uh, would you agree on this count? So the bias within the nation or towards a nation? Yeah. Which and one? Also contaminated by, by the grounding of local political uh, leaders. They're okay. grounded in particular local uh, groups, classes, and they're biased. And therefore, urbanization do often go a wrong way. Okay, so is it a corruption of local leadership that leads to this wrong urbanization? Sir, you're next. Hi, I'm Sebastian, I study at the LSE. Um, think about this debate about sustainability. There always comes this point when people say you have to change behavior, you have to alter consumption patterns, you really have to have change to the lives people lead. And I'm interested, Absolutely. you politicians, do you think you actually have the right to do that? Do you feel yourself capable of saying, this is what you're allowed to do, this is how much you're allowed to consume, this is how you should lead your life to be sustainable? Do you think you have the right to change lives to that degree? Great. So um, we've had eight questions. I'm going to ask our leaders to comment on these ones first. So sorry about that for those who wanted to get in. Um, the last question was, do you really have the right to, to tell citizens and to show to citizens how they should change their behavior? Before that, we had, isn't design the real integrative thing here? Won't that do the trick? What about the, the flexibility that's inherent in, in certain kinds of systems that are organic? Actually, isn't that flexibility part of what we need? Uh, do the shared challenges of the cities in the coastal areas provide a basis for some kind of mobilization? Um, do, can cities do it on their own or do national governments need to be more active in all of this? Um, what needs to happen in the context of the economic crisis in terms of what cities do next? What about the economic city and how does it want to use technology? And then is the bad urbanization to which Juan Close refers the product of poor local leadership? Those are the questions. If you take two each and give us your comments. Before you do that, what about your question, Andy? I think there are enough questions. Let's yeah. just do it. If, if something's missed, I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> Carl. I would like to comment on two of these questions. The first one is, can cities do it by themselves or the, do they need support from the national government? Yes, they, uh, Greg whispered here that at least they, they shouldn't be counteracted by the national government, but they need, need support for, uh, from the uh, national government in two ways. The first way is legislation, because if you want to do new things that hasn't been done before, you can be pretty sure that the, in the, this is not accounted for in the law book. So there are certain rules that have to be changed in order to facilitate uh, the implementation of the vision you have of a green city. So yes, the second thing is that usually uh, the cities will need financial support from, uh, from the national government at least in order to get started with, uh, with uh, uh, strategic projects uh, and get starting also to get revenue for th what they're doing. So mm. they need the government as a sort of midwife in order to get going. The second question is, uh, well, what about the, ec the, the economy? In, in we're talking technology and environment. What about the economy? I think the economy is totally dependent in the future on uh, using uh, ICT technology uh, and uh, working from a sus uh, sus standpoint of sustainability because uh, otherwise we will not have we will not create new jobs and I can take a concrete example from uh, from Stockholm with the Chista cluster of mobile ICT uh, it was not planned by the city hall mm. definitely not but it happened because we supplied a basic infrastructure in that area which made it easy for Ericsson, Hewlett Packard, IBM, Nokia, um, whatever, to establish themselves there. And from nothing, uh, Stockholm was not even 
in the ICT business before 1976, 7, 8, 9. From there, from zero, there are over 30,000 people working in developing many of the things you can do with your iPhones and your, your computers uh, have been developed at Chista. So, which is goes to, to, to show that it's at the new technology and the fight for a better environment can really uh, revitalize uh, an economy, in this, this time a local economy still. Thank you very much, Carl. It sounds like you're saying the platform and the climate are the responsibility of the city government. Mm. Isabel? Uh, yeah, I was, was going to come on to the design solutions point. And I think a lot of times when you listen to these kinds of debates, there's, you know, it's easy to blame the politicians. People talk about, you know, lack of political will. But one thing I've experienced is that, you know, having been a bureaucrat, you know, the bureaucracy doesn't produce interventions in the language that politicians understand and can sell. Um, both they think in terms of KPIs and pie charts, you know, this is going to reduce, you know, lost customer hours by 23%. It's like, I don't even know what lost customer hours are, but, you know, and that you can't sell to anyone. And I think design can really transform debates by saying, here's a three-dimensional color image of what things are going to look like. Think about the Olympic Park or, you know, any of these things that can really in suddenly engage people with something that they wouldn't engage with previously. Even if it's just one example and you're trying to do something in a hundred places, that can really transform the debate, which, um, and I don't think we're making enough use of that and I still don't think, you know, institutions understand how to produce kind of what politicians need in order to be more visionary in order to kind of trigger some of the decision making that we would all like to see happening. The so other you're one saying design promotes dialogue of a different kind. And it can lead you to a much better and if you want to say more visionary outcome because otherwise, you know, when you look at, um, I was talking to Amanda Burden in New York, you know, she was talking about giving somebody a map, a zoning map of an area. It doesn't tell them anything. In fact, it looks quite terrifying. Whereas if you can show them what the area is going to look like, it sounds very obvious but it's not a tool that's systematically uh, used um, because the institutions that are producing material aren't necessarily thinking in those terms. The other point I was gonna come on to was the business model models point. And I think one thing you were talking earlier about how we can, you know, it's almost easier to deliver a big project than to deliver a hundred small projects. Um, and being able to look at trials and the kind of finding a mechanism to pump trials out would be much more effective in terms of generating change, trying new approaches, but institutionally, there'll always be a preference for a cross trial over 100 small interventions that cumulatively might have a much more significant impact than cross trials. Maybe there's something to do with the way money's organized that affects mm. that as well. Right. But um, Tony Vives. Yeah, very, very quickly, I would say that rather than talking about uh, the economic city, uh, which was a very interesting point, I would be talking about uh, the, the new economy of the city, uh, which is, in fact, I think the new opportunity that we have, that's a real revolution based on four legs. Uh, very quickly, I would say city uh, that has to become energetically self-sufficient, mm. and we have a revolution there. Uh, the distributed, the distributed th uh, 3D uh, digital factory, that's what the new city has to become. Uh, citizenship implication uh, combined with representative uh, democracy, both can live together and both complement each other, which means asymmetric institutions and asymmetric governance. We could have a full uh, debate yeah. on that. And uh, at last, jumping from the current PITO model to the DIDO model, or jumping from the product in trash out current model that we have in our cities to the data in, data out, new model that we have to face mm. for the new youth. Mm. And that's the metabolism that you're talking yep. about. Yeah. Dr. Close. Uh, this, um, the, the city, the model fails because there's, uh, everybody knows uh, how to build a building and um, everybody understands the business cycle of a building. Uh, you know, the, the business plan for building a building is very easy. You get a permission, you build, you, as soon as possible, you sell, you get rich and you go away. The, as fast as you can because then the clients doesn't blame you. Uh, then what it's lacking in most of the world now, it's the business model of building a city. Mm. Then instead of building cities, we are building in the developing world buildings. And this is a mess because there's a proliferation of buildings. It's a proliferation of buildings, by the way, 
with very good architecture and very good technology, and there's no city at all. Because the business model of building the city is not there. No World Bank, sorry, uh, which are my cousins, knows how to build the street. They know how to build a hospital even, yeah. or, or, or massive construction for poor people, but they don't know how to build public space. And the, you know, this, this we are, and the city, it's about mainly uh, public space. Then I think that the cities in, in the developing world, they are going to show us the direction because they are, are the ones which are facing, uh, as it has been said here, the real problems, but they need institutions and they need to understand the concept of common good. The concept of common good and, and also in the other side, the problem of the free rider is something that uh, still is not understood. Mm. And, mm, you know, and that makes the thing uh, a, a little bit uh, uh, complex. When I talk with the mayors of the developing world, um, uh, and I say, what is your first problem? What is your main problem? For example, in sub-Saharan Africa, 65% of the uh, pop urban population lives in slums. Mm. I repeat, 65% of people live in slums in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. And when I ask uh, the mayor, what is your problem? He doesn't tell me the slum. Mm. Says, my problem is youth and employment. Mm. There's no way, you know, what is the median age of population in sub-Saharan Africa? 18 years. 18 years old, yes, you are right. The median age of sub-Saharan urban population in sub-Saharan Africa, it's 18 years old. You can smell hormones everywhere. <laughs> you know? And they are unemployed. Mm. Mm. Careful. Thank you very much, Dr. Close. So uh, I, I'll take a couple questions. The question on what gives us the right to tell people what to do in certain circumstances. You know, in many instances, you have a quote unquote Republican form of government that's not a direct democracy and for a certain limited number of things, you need to be careful about this. Th that's what people elect you to do. Mm -hmm. People used to say I was patronizing because at community meetings, I'd say, here's what we're going to do. If you don't like it, don't reelect me. And they would say, well, that's patronizing. I said, no, it's not condescending. It's actually ennobling. You actually have now a notion that elections have consequences. I'm a big believer in that. This notion of technology and the economy, I find it a wonderful thing uh, because I take this, m most of the time now, I take this bus to work. It's called the X Street bus. It goes down 8th Street in Washington, D.C., and it really traverses all the different zones of the city and all the different classes. And it's a marvelous thing to get on this bus. And now people no longer, they used to bother me, like, Mayor, what are you doing on the bus? Like, I'm there for a photo op. I'm there to go someplace, right? <laughs> So I'm on the bus now, everybody's cool. So we're on the bus and all different walks of life are on the bus. And I think it's, it's, a, it's really the power of the city that uh, the welfare mother who's taking her children uh, to daycare can see the former mayor on the bus and that's a role model, that's a powerful thing. Mm. And right, and only on the bus could you get on the bus with all these different walks of life and then get off at the Hay Adams and go to breakfast. It's a f n only in a city can that happen. And that's the power of the city, which leads me with this last point. So the Financial Times had this article about how after each recession, right, the economy is coming back slower and slower, it's creating fewer and fewer jobs, and the jobs it's creating aren't as good. So it's really the fundamental responsibility of the leader of the city to create an environment of success where that economy s can succeed. And this is where the electric city and technology comes in powerfully to me because the old way of doing business was top down. So for example, you would change government top down by, for example, putting in performance measurements throughout the government. And uh, you know, we're still waiting for that all to happen. Mm. But then there's the second way of doing things, bottom up, disruptive, right? Well, the same way of bottom up disruptive can be, I think, a powerful way uh, to enable people, give people capacity, to use, use new techniques, use technologies uh, to create uh, the commerce, to create the marketplace, which is really the ancient role of a city, mm -hmm. 
to provide that job, provide that livelihood so that the people on the bus are going somewhere when they get on that bus. Thank you very much indeed. Andy, we've come to the end of our session and we need to uh, introduce Wolfgang to close the conference in a minute, but what have you heard here that has made you worried and what have you heard here that has given you some hope? <laughs> well, I think you can't help but not um, be worried by what uh, Wang Pao said. I mean, I think if something, you know, strikes me because of everything we've heard today in terms of, you know, what's happening out there and the, 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 um, the cities that are developing and, and how they're developing, I mean, I think yours is a very stark call, which is we can have a lot of interesting conversations, but on the ground, as cities are developing at that pace, at that scale, and the number of people affected, and, the, and that the institutions there aren't there yet, and that, um, and that this is where kind of the future is going as we talk about the urban age. So if we're gonna really affect the urban age, it's one thing to have you know, different models of how congestion pricing or other good ideas might work in some of our global cities, but there's a huge number of cities that haven't even been developed yet. So I think that's a kind of wake up call that's been there throughout, but I think you've put it in very stark uh, terms. I think the, 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 you know, the positive, again, you know, as you sit around, I think and hear about the role of you know, leadership and the role of what cities. I think the role of mayors, again, is always reinforced as it has been through the urban age, which is mayors with a vision. We've talked about what's happening in Stockholm, what's happening in Barcelona and Washington, obviously here in London, is that mayors continue to be, I think, the place where have the opportunity with the right set of circumstances to be able to really affect change. That you, while you do need support at the national level and, and you do need the kind of uh, a framework that allows that. You nonetheless don't have to be entirely dependent. Mayors can be drivers of change and innovators and actually have a lot of tools at their disposal to foment change and foment innovation and can actually create that platform. And I think the challenge of what I've heard today is how one, I think how mayors who are in that position and pe or leaders who are in that position, how, the, how they learn, how they learn in a way that on the one hand respects the DNA of their city, what's unique about their city, isn't just copycat around the best practices and cities going from place to place, but nonetheless recognize that there is a new infrastructure out there. There is a new platform to be created. And I don't think we really totally understand what that is. And I think that's a question, which is we can talk about it and you hear a lot of different things over two days of proliferation of information, whether it's, you know, presentations about smart grids or smart homes or, you know, you know, you know, intelligent systems or command centers or, you know, you name it. There's uh, tons of stuff out there. And it, the, the field is moving absolutely, you know, absolutely rapidly. You know, there was an interview about a week or so ago on a talk show in the United States with Charli uh, Charlie Rose had with Jeff Bezos of, of Amazon. And he said, you know, where do you think we are in the technological revolution? What do you think we've seen? How far along are we? He said, you know, on the spectrum. He said, I don't even think we're at 0 0.0001 of what we've seen in terms of technological change. So much is happening so quickly. And I think the caution is how leaders of cities begin to understand the new infrastructure, begin to have that knowledge base and put that platform in place, not trying to predict what that outcome or specific application is, but the new platform, because that's what's gonna create the opportunity for change. And I think that's very optimistic and hopeful, but requires a new knowledge, a new urban knowledge and a new knowledge of how cities work operate and can change and the political leadership that's necessary to effectuate that. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so, yeah. colleagues, we come to the final act. I'm going to ask you to do two things. As Wolfgang Novak, who's the managing director of the Herrhausen Society, comes up to close the conference, I want you to join me in thanking Tony Vives, Joan Close, Carl Shedderfold, uh, Isabel Dedring, Anthony Williams, and Andy Altman. Thank you very much indeed.